Chekhov has a gun, but audiences have the internet. Anything that brain of yours can think of can be found. And just like that, a story that would have captivated Chekhov himself becomes predictable at best and scorned at worst. So how do you, as a modern writer, get around this? And if you're an audience member, hi, I'm about to teach you the next set of tricks to look out for. If none of it's of interest to you, you'd be the first. So here's the thing about audiences. We need to feel surprised. We expect to be tricked, but we loathe being deceived. If you think I just listed out a bunch of synonyms, then you see the problem here. So Chekhov's gun is a writing principle that traces back to a Russian playwright by the name of Anton Chekhov. I know, plot twist who in different correspondences with colleagues offered variations of the advice, everything that is not directly related to the story must be mercilessly thrown away. If you say in the first chapter that there is a gun hanging on the wall, in the second or third chapter, it must go off. And if it doesn't shoot, it shouldn't hang. I really hope the YouTube algorithm has gotten smarter because the words in this script are not sounding great for monetization. Now, this doesn't need to be a physical object either. It can be information, a character flaw or skill, or even a character themselves. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, Megan, that sounds awfully vague and all-encompassing, you would be absolutely right. In fact, anything that appears twice in a story can technically be called a Chekhov's gun when we go off of these few sentences supplied by Chekhov. No, I think we can give Chekhov a little more credit than that. I mean, these correspondences might not have been in the era of the 140 character Twitter limit, but we're talking late 1800s to early 1900s here, so he didn't have much space for clarity. In fact, he chose gun because he was thinking largely of plays, where as much as playgoers know they're viewing a performance, the presence of a gun tickles the audience's subconscious self-preservation anxiety, and this keeps the object more on the forefront of their mind, which of course makes it more apparent and frustrating when it doesn't serve a narrative purpose. So I'll be operating under the good faith assumption that he meant that if you draw attention to a gun hanging on the wall, look, it's a mint truckster marauder. You must, at some point, give it relevance or utility. Looks like some kind of lens. Guess I'll keep it for later. On the other hand, details that seem like Chekhov's gun in the clarity of hindsight but do not stand out on first viewing fall into the category of foreshadowing, which is a whole other video that I will cover soon. Alas, there remains a glaring Chekhov's gun problem that even my good faith assumption does not fix. And to Chekhov's credit, he can't have solved the problem or even predicted it because he kind of caused it. Every good magician knows that you never reveal your secrets. Stop. Enhance 15 to 23. Every good magician knows that you never reveal your secrets. Give me a hard copy right there. And Chekhov was actually not a bad magician. He just kept company with them. But here's the thing. Anton Chekhov lived from 1860 to 1904. Poor guy was writing things with pen and paper like a damn caveman. Stop. Put up 48, 47, and 2181 side by side. From 1860 to 1904. It's impossible. And so there is a shift that Chekhov did not account for. And that is, well, you, you. Internet browsing, information hungry, creatively curious. Insatiable you. Once upon a time, a human's exposure to media was limited. But then we discovered the internet, filled our pockets with tiny little computers, and started studying, hunting, domesticating, and mass producing content. And now. Could I interest you in everything all of the time? And suddenly, everyone is an avid audience member and balancing surprise and deceit gets much more complicated. 
And I can't be mad. After all, it's what I'm here for. And as much as your presence here is a part of what breaks Chekhov's gun, it's also going to help us hone the next big trick. But for now, the problem is this. Modern audiences are analyzing a constant stream of content made by writers who are analyzing writing techniques that predate film. And so, studious writers follow Anton Chekhov's beloved advice of cut everything that doesn't serve the narrative. And studious audiences come into the story knowing that anything that's mentioned is important to the story. And they've analyzed enough stories to have a good shot at unraveling exactly how it's relevant. This simultaneously makes us as audiences expect the gun to be fired, need the gun to be fired, but be frustrated when the gun is fired. If that sounds frustrating to handle as a writer, it's because it is. But before we can cover ways to hide your Chekhov's guns, we have to cover an essential question. Why even bother? Why not just throw out that old advice that you could say is dated now? So let's cover the benefits of Chekhov's guns. So I'll start simple and end with the big one. Firstly, keeping Chekhov's gun in mind as a concept can remind writers to trim away excess. Definitely not something I need help with. Now, I do not think that this should always be adhered to. Far from it. But more on that later. Next up, they can be used to build tension and anxiety, especially in horror and thriller stories. For example, The Quiet Place. The Nail. Can you feel me shuddering? Because I am. Oh, the freaking nail. Every audience member is acutely aware of its presence, and that's a constant building tension that then, when the gun does go off, makes it hit harder. Number three, they can add questions and intrigue that help captivate audiences, especially in mysteries and episodic content. I can present you with a semi-accurate sketch of the culprit. Is that enough to get us on this case? Yes. The puncture wounds. They are the key, giving me the impression that this crime could only have been committed by this guy. This guy here. Excuse me. It rewards audiences for paying attention and thus encourages future attention and debate. Modern audiences might know that the curtains could be red for purely aesthetic or thematic reasons, but Chekhov's guns provide incentive to question objects and information, which makes the story more memorable. Five? Five? Five. They can be a powerful tool in making the audience cry because A, emotional gut punches will hit the audience harder if they make the connection a few seconds before the character. I cannot deactivate until you say Ugh. you are satisfied with your care. I cannot deactivate until you say you are satisfied with your care. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. What about you? And can thus appreciate the full weight of the character's reaction. Five. B. The key to tears is overwhelming the audience, but a confused audience member will never cry. Chekhov's guns let context be delivered and established before the emotional scene, so the writers don't have to pause the emotions to explain. What are you doing? Maybe Kato likes berries too. 5C. A gun that might seem to have an obvious use can actually become an emotional weapon when the context shifts just right between establishment and use. Or when a gun is delivered with a cruel twist. A beautiful example of this is the flare in Arcane. It's used in exactly the way we expect, but the entire context is shifted around it and suddenly it means something completely different. And that shift in context then carries the value for the gun. This is my favorite as a writer, but for a deep dive into that, check out my video on that topic. And last, and certainly not least, Chekhov's guns make a narrative shift or coincidence feel realistic, earned, or planned, and thus relevant. Imagine this, a character gets shot in the chest but then splutters and sits up, pulling a metal flask from his pocket. Huzzah! The character is saved. No, not huzzah. Because if this is the first time the audience has seen the flask, this whole scene falls apart. But here's the tail fluffer. If the character put the flask in his pocket 10 seconds before being shot, the scene still falls apart because we don't believe his death and the whole affair feels overly dramatic and pointless. The balance issue then becomes introducing the gun early enough 
the, the fake out death isn't obvious, but late enough that they still kind of remember it's there. And that's just a case by case basis and I can't really advise you on that. So uh, good luck. But next up, let's talk about how to hide your Chekhov's guns cause I do have some advice on that. Fire it in an expected way and then use it for something mildly unexpected. Once a gun has been fired, most audiences kind of start to put it in the back of their mind and forget about it. Devalue the gun and or present it as a joke. What the fuck is that? Minor, minor spoilers. It's not bait, it's for you. I need you to calm down, hug the goat, shut the hell up. I leave you a bullet to remember me. Let's promise never to forget each other, Milo. Use the gun in a way that's so unexpected and yet still narratively grounded and logical that even though they were waiting for it to be used, they still get the nice little surprise feeling. What are you doing? I'm distracting you, you big turd blossom. Throw a shiny object right after the gun is shown. Squirrel. For example, in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I've never seen spiders act like that. Is immediately followed by- What's that? Pass the item off as sentimental or a play at realism. See this necklace? My mother gave it to me. Chekhov didn't technically say that a sheriff in a play couldn't carry a never fired gun as a prop to show their role. Again, we're basing the entirety of this principle off of three lines, so I can make up rules if I want. Widen the gap between introduction and use. This comes with a caveat that if the gap is too wide, a refresher might be necessary. Cannot forget the key. You must reach it. It's the way to the truth. All this time, Dad might finally explain himself. The key doesn't go to this door. What? So those are the easy methods. Now let's talk about some complicated methods. Pass it off as character building or world building. This will never work across the board and often relies on guns that don't look like guns, such as signs. What's wrong with this one? It has dust in it. Taste old. A hair. It's contaminated. Morgan took a sip and it has his amoebas. You don't even know what that word means. Because who expects water to be relevant in this scenario until you've watched the movie? On the other side, we have Princess Bride. You don't by any chance happen to have six fingers on your right hand? Do you always begin conversations this way? Anything hyper-specific will make audiences expect a payoff, which negates your hiding it. Next up, pass it off as purely a complication or a source of conflict. Audiences are very forgiving of anything that introduces struggles for the characters. <laughs> Pinja. <laughs> Pinja again. So if a gun just looks like a conflict, they'll often look the other way. Dala? Hiding informational guns in backstory and flashbacks. The caveat to this one is that this requires that any info given has a good reason to exist, and generally the gun part will need to be much more subtle than the justification for the scene's existence. And then we have too many guns to track. This one is my favorite and it comes with a huge caveat and that is that each gun still has to serve some narrative purpose. An example of this done fairly well, if I'm remembering properly, is Game of Thrones. Martin throws 500 guns onto the stage, but he fairly quickly shows consistent use of them, which builds enough audience trust that he can then introduce a gun early on and have it not fire until towards the end of the story. At this level of guns, your audience can't keep track of all of them, and so if you only have payoffs for 50% of them, you have a fairly high chance that a certain audience member might get low payoff numbers because of what they personally kept track of. 
In fact, I am willing to bet that a lot of the audience disappointment in the television showrunner-led final seasons has to do with the fact that they kicked a lot of the Chekhov guns off the stage without using them. On the flip side, we have Lost. Tannen's Mystery Magic Box. Now, I bought this decades ago, and I'm not kidding. If you look at this, you'll see uh, it's never been opened. It represents infinite possibility. So I started thinking about Lost and the stuff that we do, and I realized, oh my god, like mystery boxes are everywhere. I started to think that maybe there are times when mystery is more important than knowledge. And finally, subvert it or lampshade it. Did Jet just die? You know, it was really unclear. But I'll cover that in an upcoming video. Again, audiences are clever and they're analyzing media at a rate that we've never seen before. And so if you have go-to methods for hiding guns, they will quickly learn them and see right through you. So shake it up, mix them, break the rules and keep things interesting. If you want access to a script or a quick reference TLDR super linked up form of this content, then become a patron. I'll put all the info in the description. And thank you so much for watching. As always, I will see you in the next video.